such a slow reader and I haven't really gotten that far in our book, but I'm excited to read it more. I heard, did you finish it? Yeah. <laughs> no way! I didn't, I didn't have Wi-Fi one night and I stayed up till like two or three in the morning. So it's really good. It's good. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I can't believe you finished it. Yeah. I'm still probably on like the first <laughs> section. I saved Maybe it chapter away. three or four. This is single and probably asexual with Kendra K. Hello! Hi! <laughs> Hi, friend. Hi, friend. Hi. My new friend that I just love and adore so much already. That I picked up in a dirt lot. Yeah. <laughs> Essentially. I pick up friends in parking lots all the time. I mean, mm. that's just what we're going to be doing for the, the rest of the, <laughs> the immediate future. Foreseeable future. In the vans. Mm -hmm. Well, this is my friend, Katie. Dr. Katie Cook. We met at Descend on Bend not too long ago, mm -mm. and Katie also has her own podcast, which is awesome and amazing. Thank you. And it's really good. It's called Emotions at Work. Go check it out. And then you're going to plug all your stuff at the end because, okay. yeah, we, <laughs> they've got to find, they've got to follow your um, journey in the van, which you'll briefly talk about too. I love our van journeys. Yes. That's, that's like my favorite. I know. It's so awesome to find like another van person that's I also know. doing like creative work on the road and mm -hmm. yeah so anyways Katie is sitting down with us today to talk about sex Yay! <laughs> my favorite topic after vans after vans. vans and sex but we will let you know why we are talking mostly about sex and just from a standpoint of we are both so different in that mm -hmm. way so I'm super excited about this conversation me too and like to see where we both sit at certain topics and such. Yeah, yeah it's going to be really good. So yeah. I'm going to let Katie introduce herself. Tell us what you do, your job, and your van. And yeah, and then we're just going to jump into it. Okay, that sounds good. Okay, good. Um, so my name's Katie. I am a psychologist. Um, I, let's see, I'm a former expat. I lived abroad for a long time in the UK. Got my doctorate over there. I... I came home actually to write my first book, so I got a book deal, but London's so expensive, like the rent is insane there, so. Uh, so was, that's why you came back was to write the book. Yeah, so yeah. I got my book deal and I was like, I want to do this, but I'm working full time. I know I'll never finish it if I'm here. Rent is like right. ungodly. So came home where it was a little more affordable, wrote the book, um, and then started working for myself. So I've been working for myself for four years now, almost. Almost nice. four years now. Yeah. So that's yeah. been good. And I do consulting and coaching mm -hmm. um, and training around mental health and well-being, mostly for organizations, some personal stuff too. Like I run support groups now recently and um, yeah, I love it. Anything mental health related is kind yeah. of my jam. And then the reason I ended up in the van Betty. was Betty, who yes. is parked right next door. We're staring at her. Um, Betty and, and Dee Dee here <laughs> together with we, Katie and Kendra. <laughs> <laughs> and Fig and Zeke. And Fig and Zeke, we have pairs of everything. It's like, yeah. it's like an arc. It is. Yeah. It is. Yeah, two, two of everything. And we do this thing always. You guys can't see it right now, unfortunately. But, like, yeah. we park our van so, like, our sliding doors are facing each other. We can just, like, hop back between the two. Easy access. It's so great. Yeah, it's really honestly. Um, so, yeah. So, the van arose because I wanted to write another book on the psychology of America. And I wanted to do it while I was, like, actually roaming around America, in America. researching yeah. talking to people. So I, the loose plan is to spend a year in the van doing research on mental health and well-being and psychology in America. And then, I don't know. Hole up in a place and then yeah. write that book. Exactly. Which you said you have a location in California that you're going to stay at and then just... I mean, I think so. So last time I wrote um, in Oakland, up in the hills, and then this time I might try to drag all you guys to Mexico. So... We, we don't know yet. That's right. Yeah. Because you're going to write it. You're going to start it around January, February, 2023. Yeah, exactly. God, that sounds so far away, but it's not. But it's not. Mm -hmm. I am so curious to also see if you're going to like love van life so much to the point where you're just going to continue to live in it. I know. Because a year, I mean, a year for me went by like, like that. It's... I can snap. <laughs> it, went, <laughs> it went by like that. Yeah, no, it's yeah. so fast. And like, it's so, like we talk about time a lot. You yeah. and I write like how time is so weird when you're out of your routine and like doing different things every day and yeah. having to like watch your avocados slowly mature 
You when it's quite the opposite when you're in a home and you have to throw away seven avocados at once. Yeah, and there's like a theory, I forget the name of it now, but I looked it up after we were talking about this, about like how time goes so slow yeah. when you're in new situations. Because mm. like it's like stretched and you're having to take in so much stimuli. Right. Almost like when you're a little kid. Right. And like time seems so slow because everything's like new. Yeah. And you're like having to make sense of it. Whereas like when you're in your routine doing your you life. You don't think about it. No. Because you're like, I know Mm-mm. what to do. I know what to do in work. I get up. I go to the bathroom. I brush my teeth. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. You're on your loop like in Westworld. Like they're just on their loops. Oh my gosh. Such a great show. Yeah. So. Wow. <laughs> so yeah. So that is the van plan and I might love it and yeah. I might stay longer yeah. or just, I don't know. We'll see. If I'm no a good plan. enough caravan buddy, I'm sure I can convince you to at least go through 2023. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, watching you guys do this is like, I mean, that's, it's just, it's the cutest. Yeah. You guys are such good travel buddies. And Big is, Big is not quite as fun as Zeke is, but mm. she's, she's a pretty good fuzzy. She's pretty easy. She's easy. Yeah. She's low maintenance. I don't think sure. she loves it, but I don't think she hates it. I don't think she loves anything. She's a cat. Yeah. Like cats are yeah. just the... <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I love that. And yeah, to preface again, Katie and I are, we're in our vans, we're parked side by side, we're in a parking lot, it's pretty quiet, but I also have Zeke behind me, if anybody knows my dog, he has a mind of his own, and is very spoiled, so he'll do what he wants, so if he barks, I apologize in advance, but he's being very cute right now, and just laying on the bed. After he gave Katie a whole bunch of love, and yeah. We got our love out of our system. Got Zeke, our love out of our Zeke system. and I have a similar attachment style, which we might touch on. Maybe. We are definitely going to touch on, yeah. and yes, he very much <laughs> He's literally staring at Katie right now. <laughs> and we're, he knows he cannot go close. We're checking in to make sure we still love each other. Yes. Yeah, we're good. Oh my gosh. Okay, so your work, psychologist, not psychiatrist. Whoops, excuse me. Correct. Because psychiatrist prescribes medication to those who need it. Yes. And then your area of psychology, which you told me today, which I really love because I feel like I've never really heard this before, or the therapist slash psychologist that I've always seen in the past specialize in family, you know, relationships, or for me, when I started therapy, it was like young adults, teens, teen therapist, young adult therapist, but your um, work is the psychology of progress, mm-hmm. which I love. Cause I, I mean, life is just a whole big progress thing. And it's not like you can go from point A to point B in like a day or even a year, yeah. uh, depending on what you're going through or what trauma you're trying to like process or heal from. So tell me just mm-hmm. more about the psychology of progress. <laughs> I had to look back at my notes there for a second. Yeah, no, you're totally right. So like I grew up going to marriage and family therapists and stuff, like since I started yep. therapy when I was like seven wow. and like usually they have a particular like bent, right? Like trauma or kids or divorce or whatever, right? Like there's a right. specialty. Um, so this is kind of a niche and most psychologists, you should like when you get your PhD, you usually go one of two ways. Like you become a licensed practitioner and you work mm-hmm. one-on-one or in groups or whatever with people helping them or right. you go into academia so those are kind of usually the two branches and right. I didn't want to do either of those two things yes, um right. I wanted to write I wanted to mm-hmm. kind of look at big social issues and because my my dissertation was on kind of exactly what you said like how we get from point a to point b and what that looks like for yeah. us and like that can be it's different for everybody obviously Um, depending on the issues and the tools you have at hand and all that kind of stuff. But um, basically any kind of progress, whether it's individual, whether it's an organization, which is kind of what I do at work, or whether Mm -hmm. it's, you know, world and social and cultural progress has three parts. So you start with like an awareness of a problem, right? So say like climate change or whatever. Yeah. And you go, oh shit, like we, we have to work on this or like say it's trauma and like you recognize you're having the same relationship patterns over and over again. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh shit, I got to deal with this. So Mm -hmm. you start doing this next piece, which is like integration before you can get to the like behavioral piece where you're like, okay, this is what I actually have to do to make things change. And so the integration piece is really, really important. So like you look at like what would actually help, where are you at? Why are you like that? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, why is the world set up in this way. So it's kind of like recognition. It's all like the, yeah. So you, you recognize and are aware of what's going on first. And then you kind of have this piece where you really try to figure it out. And that might involve like research or, Mm -hmm. um, 
kind of like internal reckoning with stuff, looking back on your past, looking at your patterns, going to a therapist, talking about it. Yeah. Um, if it's a social issue, it's obviously different, right? Because this happens on like a grander scale. Right. Um, the integration piece when you're looking at societies is super messy and super long and super difficult. And I think yeah. that's why we get so disheartened mm -hmm. about social progress is because it takes a really long time. Whereas individual progress can obviously be done in like a but shorter span. But you were more interested in that the social progress of, which is why you started your first book and why you're doing your second book. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And that's like a lot. That's a big undertaking. Yeah. And it's fun, right? And you like different people kind of chip away at it over time. Right. Um, so you build your work on like the back of other people's amazing stuff yeah. and then other people take it up and keep figuring it out. And Yeah. But yeah, it's been really neat. So I'm looking at like the mental health of the country and why it is that way and how that relates to things like individualism specifically and mm -hmm. inequality specifically. Yeah. And how that impacts how people are feeling and then how they behave and cope and all that kind of stuff. So. Yeah. And then just how people operate in different states. Because Katie's going to all states, except for Hawaii and Alaska, I'm assuming. I'm going to go to Hawaii and Alaska. I just oh, might go by plane, plane or to boat both. instead of by van. Yes. Yeah. I feel like I heard it takes like, <laughs> what, two weeks to even just drive to Alaska? Yeah, it's like 3, from maybe, miles. Yeah. Like just from like, you know, the tippy top part of like Washington state or something. Yeah. yeah. And you like don't see people no. along the way for like days. Yeah. Oh, I do want to go to Alaska, but I, it's like, I feel like I would have to carve out like uh, three months or so. hundred percent. But yeah, like even just like the, um, social dynamic of people and there's the psychology of them within their state mm -hmm. is going to be so oh, different yeah. too, because obviously states are very different. We've got states that are more, you know, one side or the other politically states that are suffer from climate disaster and change. And then states uh -huh. that are pretty like low maintenance when it comes to natural disasters and stuff. And yeah. like, I mean, just thinking about a lot of the people recently who have lost their homes in like the West coast due to fires mm -hmm. and like the strain that that could also put on them. Oh yeah. That's a whole nother branch actually now of psychology is like really? existential. Yeah, I think I was talking to Sam about this last night. Yeah. They have like existential psychologists who help people kind of manage their anxiety about like the future and, and what's going on in the world and climate and war and change and, you know, financial instability, like all these big ticket items that yeah. like we previously might not have had to, might not have consumed as much of our bandwidth on a day to day basis. But now we literally spend so much of our time right. thinking about these things, right? Or not making life choices about them and like not having kids or not yeah. settling down or not saving for the future because yeah. like who knows if there's going to be one. So it's right. like this whole new interesting subfield of psychology that I think is so cool. Yeah, and so you basically just kind of, like, answered the, a question I was just thinking of when you were talking. Like, the psychology post-2020 has got to be so different. I mean, most people who, all people maybe who are alive have never experienced that. The last plague we've had was, like, over yeah, 100 years right. ago or so. 18. Yeah. yeah. So that's, like, I mean, just, yeah, psychology just post this pandemic and especially in America when we had so much, like, social justice happening and... Yeah. Yeah. I didn't even think about the pandemic piece, but yeah, that's huge too, right? Of you course. Remember like, Corona? Yeah, we're kind of we're kind of still doing <laughs> kind it. Kind of still in it. I know yeah. people who are still getting sick today. Right. Yeah. yeah. And like you you just become, I guess, accustomed to it and kind of right. manage it. But yeah, that's a whole nother thing is like future, you know. Yeah. Global pandemics or right. you know, there's so oh. much so much to worry about. So much but also to worry so much about. to like be excited about. True. And grateful for. For sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be really interested to read your book oh, thank you. because I've already been with slash near you when you've had interviews and you tell me about some of them briefly and just it's going to be so interesting to hear the viewpoints of people and mm -hmm. I think especially post 2020 because like people may have lost their jobs and it wasn't their decision or it wasn't their choice and mm -hmm. just how much strain that puts on people, especially when it is so expensive to just live. Live. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And then there's the, like the converse of that too. Like a lot of people have just thrown their hands up and quit their jobs and been like, I can't exist in this dynamic in the system anymore yeah. because it's not, I'm not getting anywhere. Right. And I'm so frustrated and my mental health is so poor. Right. Um, like if they, I'm going to live the rest of this life, maybe going to blow up one day. I know that's a little dramatic, but, but you know, like my, I might as well be doing something that I love or yeah, changing <laughs> 
the, okay, I don't need to work that nine to five that pays me 200K a year. I'm going to downsize and this is going to be what I need. And then I'm just going to work around those needs and be happy that way. Yeah. Yeah. Like life design is another really interesting branch of kind of, you know, psychology or or self-help that I think is super interesting. Yeah. Like designing a life that's actually aligned with your needs. Right. And makes you feel fulfilled. That is such a good one because I will have friends that will say, you know, like little things here and there of like, oh, I, I'm not where I'm at. Like, I, I thought I was going to be here at this time. And then like, oh, well, we're stressed because of this and this. Well, it's like, well, how do you want your future to look? Like, are we stressing about income and money because you need to portray a certain way on social media mm-hmm. or just like within yourself? Like you think that's what you need or is it? other stress like yeah it's that is so fascinating but it is also hard to look ahead and yeah. looking ahead can be scary yeah 100 yeah. percent. there's a really good book called um finding your own north star and it's probably the book that changed my life the most in the last 10 years i would okay. say and i read it mid-pandemic i would say and right before i started converting and decided to do the van yeah and it was responsible for so many changes in my life but it really does like help you find like your north star and like what is important to you what makes you actually feel good at like a very very deep cellular level and breaks down the differences between like what she calls it's by martha beck I was just going to yeah. ask the perfect Martha Besk, mm-hmm. Beck finding your North Star. Yeah, I think she's like a former Harvard psychologist or something, or <sighs> P, I don't know, professor. And she breaks it down between like your essential self, so like what is essential to you, feels true, feels right, right. and your social self and what you're talking about oh. and all the things that you feel like you should do or where you should be or like, you know, the job maybe your parents made you feel like you should have or right. whatever. Or, the or relationship. pressures of where are you at you having a family and yeah. like especially within like families that could be a lot of pressure too mm-hmm. that is really it's interesting such a good, it's such a good book okay i yeah. am definitely I'm top three jotting that down i'll <laughs> add a link in okay. to people oh, for they can yeah because that's really that is really really cool okay on to sex okay <laughs> yes <laughs> One of my favorite topics. Okay, so we, I, Katie, when I are, we're sitting and having this conversation in the first place because when I met Katie, I was in the process of getting my podcast together and she was like, oh my gosh, well, I have a podcast. And so, you know, we naturally just started talking about it and I told her about my podcast and you were basically like, that is really interesting. And from someone who myself is like, haven't had sex in like seven years, like I just don't do it. And then meeting you and you're like, I like sex. And also being a doctor, being a psychologist, you, I remember you saying like, I would love to talk to you about the psychology behind all of this. And I was like, yes, because this is, again, I was, I mentioned in the podcast before, I want to talk to all different people on all different walks of life. And I think it's going to be a really cool conversation that we're going to have because it's two different viewpoints and I'm just I'm looking forward to it yeah like especially because you and I are different I think about well the I mean asexuality versus like hypersexuality right right and then also like being single versus being in a relationship and I know we're both single right now but like Mm -hmm. as you will probably learn I love relationships and (laughs) seek them out actively and it's it's so interesting to like like just see the difference between that and like know that yeah Like, we're both, like, so happy. We're both doing what we're doing. Right, exactly. the psychological differences are super interesting. Yeah. And, like, why we are the way we are. Right. And I, oh my gosh, yeah. We're just going to get into it because I am so freaking excited for this. And, like I mentioned earlier, like, I'm excited to interview my friend Lona, who's a Tantra teacher, who is Polly, and she partakes Mm -hmm. in all the things. And it's just, again, those two different viewpoints and, like, having a candid conversation about it. I'm just, Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm so looking forward to it. Okay, so my first question for you still like psychology type of talk yep. what is the psychology behind sexuality or hi- behind hypersexuality just in general not for you yet but just as a doctor because like, you're in this realm yeah what is the psychology behind someone who is hypersexual who seeks sex out what yeah what is that person going through bodily mind spirit mm-hmm. whatever that's like this is i need this which is fine to need sex. I'm just, I'm bare, you know, I'm just, I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> just because I'm not having sex doesn't mean that anybody else can't have sex. <laughs> right. And just because I love sex and want to have it all the time doesn't right. mean that I think anyone, you know, shouldn't or 
like whatever like right. no, I think yeah. whatever works for if everybody. If you can have sex every day and that's what you want to do, freaking do it. 100%. Yeah, or if you don't want to have sex for 7 years like me, freaking do, do it. it. <laughs> <laughs> it's whatever, yeah. Do what feels good. Exactly. Um so I let's see. Um so I should probably start by saying this is not my area of expertise, right? Okay. Like I've never Well, we're ending the podcast right now. <laughs> <laughs> Kill Cut, it. moving on. Plug, plug. Let's go for a hike. <laughs> um, but yes. I do know um, part of, I know about sex addiction mm. a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and sex and relationship addiction, there's a group for, for this, just like there's an Al-Anon and an AA and a, you know all these groups that meet about different right. types of addiction. Right. It is related to the same part of your brain. So like okay. when I... It feels like a hit when Mm. I am like, more for me, it's relationships than sex actually. But like when I am seeking out, um, a relationship or something feels like exciting and new or whatever, it feels to me what I imagine. And I don't really do drugs, but what I imagine Mm. a hit feels like. Right. 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 Um, so part of it is this, this addiction, right. And it can be, but it doesn't have to be. Mm -hmm. So there's the psychological kind of addict piece, which I definitely have a bit of and then there's also like the hormonal biological piece um and I think they kind of for me like those are the two pieces that kind of act together right there's also just people who you know have one or the other or just you know love sex but aren't addicted to it there's all right. variations in the same you right know, different colors but um my family kind of anecdotally I know is like fairly sexual okay so my and this isn't I I don't even know how to talk about this without it sounding kind of odd and I have no judgment about this really but my grandpa um cheated on my grandma okay he was like he was I think a sex addict and would Mm. cheat on her with like hundreds of women Wow. I know they're both past now so I don't feel too weird talking about it but right um and then I know other members of my family <laughs> have a high sex drive yeah. in the same way I do. Okay. So like, even if I, for instance, I'm like not with someone or like seeking out a relationship or dating or whatever, I will still like masturbate a lot. Right. So you still my, have that urge naturally. Yeah. So yeah. my sex drive is just naturally, I think high. Harder. Like I remember masturbating as a kid. I want to say at the age of like four yeah. or five. Right. And like being like, Oh, this is my jam. Like I, Yes. So I think for me, a lot of it is hormonal. A lot of it's biological. Mm-hmm. I just naturally have a higher sex drive. Yeah. And it, it, I have noticed it actually decrease over the last like five years a bit. Right. So it's not as intense. It's not as all like consuming as it used to be. Decreased by 5%. Not that much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still into it, but like yeah. I don't need to be like out there all the time. Right. But you've noticed over the years, like, yeah. you know. So I probably had sex with more people than most people. Right. I would say. Right. Um, but the addiction part more to relationships is what's really interesting to me. Yeah. And I think that's where like the psychology piece and like what has shaped you and what's happened to you and what your childhood was like mm-hmm. kind of and the messaging you got around mm-hmm. relationships and around yourself and worth and all that kind of stuff becomes like really important and interesting to kind of tease out like okay well what is just like natural what do I want because I'm a woman and I have needs and I want to fulfill them and what is like me you know trying to fill something in a maybe unhealthy way right interesting so essentially for those who and not just yourself but as a psychologist when you look at people who have sex addiction sex addiction addiction or who are hypersexual it is it's 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 what you said it's like it's like an addiction it's like someone who's addicted like an alcoholic or someone who Mm -hmm. is on drugs or anything like that it's just kind of like there's this little thing in your brain or Mm -hmm. like like patterns or habits that you just have stayed with you for a long long time it's just kind of just sticks there yeah and like you said that that like dopamine hit that high yeah yeah and that's why like the 12-step programs for all of those things whether it's um sex alcohol drugs love relationships whatever Mm -hmm. why all the programs work the same and are modeled the same because the addictive nature of wanting those things is very very like cognitively and behaviorally similar right yeah so it's a different thing that you're searching out yeah but it's the same receptors in your brain that are getting right. hit. like the same process that someone who is a sex addict versus someone who 
is like an alcoholic like they go through the same things but their vice is just something totally different someone likes to drink and someone likes to right and some will have obviously like if you're like a heavy smoke like drug addict or user or whatever like your withdrawal symptoms will be different because like the chemicals in your body are gonna be harder to to withdraw from it'll be just you know a different nature if you're like in withdrawal from not having sex for four months like i've been right just kidding I'm not having withdrawal symptoms, but yeah, not at all. <laughs> it has been it has been four months, and that does feel like a long time. Really? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. I know. You I know. Over. I know. Yeah. That yeah. That didn't that didn't happen that one time. Yeah. Got it. Got it. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah. That is just that is so fascinating, and it's yeah. I didn't even realize and think about how someone who is just like I may, could be even just addicted to smoking cigarettes like yeah. how that is like a similar thing to yeah. people and it, it's an addiction it's something that yeah. I mean as you know as long as you're not doing it in, the, in a way that people seek out AA and help when it's like okay this is mm-hmm. extremely affecting my life you wanting to have sex it's not affecting your life you're just like this is what I do yeah. it's it's healthy it's natural it's normal right yeah but I think there's a tipping point too where you know that like you're doing it maybe like for the wrong reasons. And I think that's where the relationship part comes in mm-hmm. a little bit more. Right. Cause sex is just an act, right? It's like the relationship between the two people that is actually like interesting and laced with like emotions and mm-hmm. feelings and kind of like a backstory probably. Yeah. Like why, why you're doing that. Right. Why you want like to connect with someone right. in that way. Right. I feel like that's how I operate because I'm demisexual. I'm probably asexual, which is like the title of the podcast. But being demisexual, I need to have, like, an emotional connection with someone in order to, like, even feel things within myself. Yeah. But I feel like I never shame anybody for doing anything, but I've never had a one-night stand because I just don't think I could ever do it. Mm. I could probably sleep with someone if I, like, developed, you know, feelings and, like, a connection over, like, maybe, you know, at least a decent course of time. It could still be, like, relatively short in some people's eyes, but... Um, the, like the one night stand thing, I just don't, I, there's something in my brain that's just like, this isn't enough time to connect with somebody. And like, and I need that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that is like what everybody kind of wants to, right? Like right. everyone for the most part wants to deep, deep down, right. like feel loved, feel seen, feel heard, feel connected. And then ideally maybe like sex is a, like. A result of, of that or right. a, you know like right. an offshoot of that I don't know but yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. so fascinating mm-hmm. so you identify as being hypersexual you're not a sex addict but you're like probably a little hypersexual correct yeah I'm not a sex addict I've never actually been to a group um for mm-hmm. love and sex addicts but I know um I love addicts yeah, yeah love wow. addicts mm-hmm. Identify more as a love addict than a yeah, sex addict. I yeah, yeah. Because you were saying that you yeah. you you want that relationship. That yeah, yeah. But and can, I think mm-hmm. that's exactly like, and you can do it in different ways, right? And we can right. talk about attachment styles and whatever. But like, I think historically I have done relationships in not super healthy ways mm-hmm. all the time, mm-hmm. and that was partly because I didn't have a great role set of role models yeah so I didn't know what I was doing right and part of it is figuring it out and just you know that takes time, time and iterations yeah. and practice yeah. and um I think I'm I think I'm getting there yeah for yeah. sure so I mean my next question um I have it on my phone but it's kind of long so I'm going to try and like paraphrase in a way and I know you kind of like talked about this a little bit but for you personally, you always you touched on your grandpa and a couple other people in your family, but what do you feel for you personally has got you to this point today where you are someone who's hypersexual? Is it the family background? Do you think it's the, what, like, what is it for you? It's like a very broad question because it's, it's things added up over time. It could have been something that happened a year ago that you're like, Oh, well, this is also is like included in my journey of why I like to have sex. Yeah. <laughs> and you're, I mean, part of it is really basic too, right? Yeah. Like sex feels good right. for me. Right. Um, but I think I was thinking about this this morning when I knew we were going to chat this afternoon and I was like, what? Like when I'm thinking about my family and like that, we're all kind of like this in a way, like, what is that? And right. I was thinking about intergenerational trauma. 
and like how things get passed down and sometimes that is like hormonal and biological and that could be right. all that it is i don't know purely genetics that it could be yeah, yeah. or a it, fraction of it could be or part of it could be something more that like is you know unhealed or untapped or mm-hmm. unexamined like within my family lineage not psychologically. just from you but yeah like right. ancestors right. even going that far yeah but I think for me like the main reason I have a love addiction mm-hmm. I don't think I've ever said it like that before oh, that feels it. really weird um, to love. <laughs> <laughs> we have a song in the background yeah 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 um, is because of the way I was raised. So I was raised mm. by someone who was very withholding of love. Mm. Um, so my dad was an addict and an alcoholic and not hypersexual to my knowledge. Right. Um, so that did, definitely didn't like come from him. But um, he was really abusive and really, my childhood was really scary. Yeah. And he was super, like, let's see, emotionally abusive, verbally abusive, never physically abusive but very neglectful. So I would say neglect was like my main form of abuse. Like I would get locked in cars for like eight hours, 10 hours and just like abandoned no. or like have to deal with him when he was like high Drunk, and I was yeah. eight or yeah, right on the back of motorcycles when he was drunk, like all this like really scary stuff as a kid. And then just, you know, screamed at, yelled at, like berated, yeah. like nothing I ever did was like good enough. So mm-hmm. I think all of that kind of set me up like this really complicated relationship with my dad Mm -hmm. um and he said he loved me all the time so it was also like super confusing because his words and like his behaviors like don't match match right so i just think like okay like love then like relationships are when you're kind of chasing after something like this feels Mm -hmm. familiar like i'm trying to constantly like be okay for him like like I don't know what's the word I'm looking for. Kind of like shape shift almost to like be this person who is like lovable. Yeah. Um, And so I think like into my adulthood, not that I've sought out abusive people by any stretch. Like I seek out like the nicest guys. Yes. But I'm constantly like putting myself in positions where I have to chase things and not necessarily get like the outcome that I want. Yeah. Put a lot of obstacles in my own kind of way. Choose people that probably aren't right for me for a variety of reasons right. that have nothing to do with them or their you know worth their quality as people but just like that aren't good matches for mm-hmm. me because I am in this pattern or have been historically yeah. where I I want to prove myself and you know be different be lovable right. there's a lot of codependency stuff too that comes up for people who are um, children of alcoholics like so much codependency like you really just yeah. want the other person to like validate you right tell you you're okay tell you you're worthy yeah and you have to learn over time that like that doesn't come from other people yeah so it's a it's a long at least in my experience it's been like a really long journey of yeah. figuring that out but I think that's why like the, the love addiction came up is because like I was raised in this place where I was constantly seeking it out and then I just kept doing that as an adult yeah and that's not very fun no (laughs) no (laughs) oh my gosh that is that's fascinating for to me because I have um a similar ish background where I was never expressed love in my family um like I never heard my specifically my mother my dad was you know he worked a lot so I just childhood memory is a little foggy and I think it's because you like you know you try to block it out a little bit Mm -hmm. but like my mom never told me verbally that she loved me and I never really felt that and then the communication in our our, my immediate family with my dad and my brother and my mom and I it was just not something that was ever like Mm. nurtured or fostered and so it was that was just super hard but similar to you like I will definitely different like thank god you know abuse and is not okay and um it's terrible that your dad was like that but um he did have an addiction too and it's Mm -hmm. like but it's so um interesting to have that perspective of we kind of both didn't feel that love yeah, but then our but actions are totally different. Yeah, like it yeah. manifests in these different right. ways. Like right. Like I'm like I'm like I'm not loved. I'll never be loved. So I'm just gonna shut it out. No one's gonna want me. Do you think that's where your like lack of interest in relationship comes from? I think so. And my family is 
my mom and I, my dad have been together for 33 years and they were never ever they never like showed affection huh. towards each other I remember when I was older I saw my mom um I think she like jumped on top of my dad or something they were like kissing and I was like oh my god <laughs> But it was just something that I had never seen before. So I was never shown it. And then I think just my innate being of like, I do all these things in my life, run a business, build a van. And it's like, I feel like I have this strong sense of like being independent. And part of me, there's a lot to this. Part of me is like, I can do everything myself. I don't need anybody. Mm -hmm. Part of me also is like, if I ever do get in a relationship, what is my role in this relationship? If I'm with a man, do I have to be like this submissive woman? Which I know that's like not the case for relationships, but like, do I have to play this role that's also like feminine or like, is this person going to want to bring in the bacon, so to speak, and like have me, it's cause it's like, I love my job. I love to work. I love to explore. It's a lot, it's definitely a lot, but, um. Growing up, I definitely wasn't shown that a lot within my, just my own family. And then, you know, divorces within grandparents, aunts and uncles and stuff, and just kind of just messy, chaotic relationships. Yeah. Um, I never really had good role models of a relationship. Yeah. yeah. And then that added of the me just not feeling loved and then going through depression insanely as a teen and trying to work on this when my mother was doing her best to just work with me and I was, it, yeah, it was, it's a lot of things that add up, but yeah. So yeah. what's wrong with me? No, <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with me. Nothing. 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 Nothing's wrong with us. Um, but it, it is like those, those things you learn in childhood, like shape you so much. I had one yes. psychologist friend describe it to me or a marriage and family therapist friend describe it to me as like, like people are like trees, right? And you're like shaped by, the weather around you and like the soil that you like grow in and like that could mean you you know are stable and straight up and leafy and green or that could mean right. you are like weathered as all hell and you don't have the ner the proper nutrients yeah. to grow right, yeah. right right so I think like everyone and you can have identical circumstances too and end up totally like different right yeah. like I see that all the time from people who are experience abuse or like hard childhoods or or whatever, and they they have such different reactions to it because mm. we're all mm. like, we have such different little personalities and yeah. you know innate ways of dealing with things and coping yeah. mechanisms and stuff. So, but mine has definitely been to like chase things that seem unobtainable, stuff that you never that, got when you were yeah, growing up because yeah. that pattern is familiar, and that's yeah. all it is. It's familiarity, right? Right, and I don't I cognitively know it's like not healthy. I try not to do it anymore. I still find myself doing it from time to time. Right. Especially in my head. Like before right. I even get into a relationship, I'm like, oh, is this person like my person? We were talking like, about told that you. today. <laughs> I had a new one today, guys. Yeah. Oh I my found God, a new yeah. one today that could be my person. Literally, and I'm like, yeah. what is your last name? Like Disney princess movies oh, fucked us oh girls, God. cisgendered girls who were born and like were just shoved mm. Cinderella and you know, all these things. It's like, oh, so so gnarly it and is. so bad for you and it is. I wish I had never seen any, any of, of them yeah. yeah honestly it's yeah. yeah because that combined with like all this stuff you go through as a kid like you're, you're just setting yourself up for right you know, and then yeah you romanticize you just look at someone you can't even like have a conversation it's like is that okay so what are you prince charming like? yeah. sir Excuse i can me, see sir. us doing this on the weekends <laughs> and this is your career this is my career we're kids gonna have do yeah what's you <laughs> your last name that yeah, well yeah that's silly. so funny that you uh, yeah when you mentioned that you don't think what you do is healthy because i feel the same way about myself really? you got in this position of you chase because it was something that you never got. And for me, I don't chase because I'm so used to what I was given mm. that this is my comfort zone, mm. which is not great. Like, I know that's not healthy because we have to push ourselves out of our comfort zones. And especially for me, I know in the future I want a relationship. I don't want to mm. be alone forever. I have been for most of my life. Mm. And it's hard at times. It's definitely hard at times. Just mm. having, as humans, we are you know, social creatures and we need connection and we need physical connection too. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. So yeah, I agree. Like you think you're unhealthy. I think I'm unhealthy. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're working on it. Though, we're right? working on it. Like, yeah. We're not so... unhealthy, but, but that's a, the you know, negative self-talk that we yeah. give ourselves. We're but, like, this is not great. Kendra, this is not great. Katie, what are you doing? What are you doing? It's the pattern that's unhealthy, right? Like we're perfectly Habits. fine. Yeah. Um, the way we are. Yeah. And 
you kind of and that's like the the awareness and the integration piece right like we're working on integrating it and like figuring out what is going to work and what's going to yeah. be like a healthy doable solution that we can sustain and like right. trialing different things and seeing what feels good that's like the kind of like practice yeah piece where you kind of get to a point that's like okay yeah. like this feels this feels pretty good I can, right and all I say all I want is like a half, happy healthy relationship and it's true I do yeah. but like the point of of getting there is yeah. just so messy because it's so hard to unlearn stuff. It is. Okay, I have another question. Mm-hmm. So what do you think your relationship to self is when it comes to you being hypersexual? So I think that was a very easy way when I was younger. So I lost my virginity when I was like, I just turned 15. Okay. Um, which, Pretty, I think, typical for most people. Yeah. I lost stranger. mine at 24. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost a decade later. <laughs> I mean, honestly, though, like, there's no, there's no right time. There's no right. right? Exactly. So no judgment about 15, 24, 45, doesn't matter. Does not matter. Um, And I felt, did I feel ready? I don't really know. But, like, I (laughs) I was with a stranger. It was a one-night stand. Mm -hmm. Like, it wasn't, like, special. Right. Um, But it was just a way of, for me at that time, and I don't feel like this anymore at all, um, but it was a, what is that, evidence, I guess, that I was, like, attractive, worthy, desirable, like someone wanted me. Yes. And I think when you grow up feeling so unworthy and undesirable, not in a sexual way, obviously mm-hmm. with your family, but like mm-hmm. when you feel like you're not okay for yeah. whatever reason and you're not whole, mm-hmm. you start trying to fill yourself up with things. Sometimes dick, sometimes food, sometimes, right? Like, like jobs or degrees or whatever. Yeah. And honestly, like degrees are one of my other things that I filled myself up with. Like education. So yeah. So yeah. I got this messaging when I was little that like a B is for bad. You have to get uh-huh. straight A pluses or you, you worthless. Got to go to college, so, which yeah. you did. I did not, but yeah. Yeah. And so that was like part of my messaging in my family and also just from my father again. And I then like excelled in education. And at first it was this really unhealthy thing that I did Mm -hmm. it, I think for the wrong reasons. Like Mm -hmm. I wanted to prove myself. I wanted to show I was worthy because I had a shitload of education. Right. Are we allowed to swear on the podcast? Oh, absolutely. I'm marking (laughs) all of my um, episodes as explicit because I curse a lot. Okay. Yeah. Um, I held back a couple times, but now I'm going to, I'm going to let them fly. Fucking go for it. Um, people ask me that in interviews too. And I'm like, yeah. Oh yeah, I swear more than anyone you've ever met, sir. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, I just, I don't know. Sex has always been this thing that I, I think I used to, Oh, sorry. I was on education. Uh, yeah. Sex Speaking and education. Out, yeah. Both. Sex education. <laughs> sex education. <laughs> There's a TV show called that. I think. <laughs> there is. Yeah, it's good. yeah. Seeking out that education was yeah, another form of, of validation like for you. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And sex was like that too. Like, Oh, men do like me. Like I am pretty. Like, because I got this messaging my whole childhood that, like, I was fat, I was ugly, like, no, yeah, I was a chubby gorgeous. kid. And I was chubby, I think, because I, it was such a reaction. Like, it was this form of protection for me. Yeah. Like, food was like, okay, well, if you have a layer of fat on you, like, there's this layer between you and your father that is at least, like, physical. Yeah. Like, he's not gonna... The, you, it, it was child abuse. Absolutely. Yeah. It wasn't physical abuse, but it was abuse, and that's how you coped. How else are kids going to cope? I mean, they can't go out and do drugs. I mean, maybe some do, but it's like when you're eight, yeah. when you're five, you're just, you're going to eat. Gonna do? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was what I did. That was one of the things I did. So right. sex, education, food, mm-hmm. those are kind of like my go-to mm-hmm. comfort um, things, I yeah. would say. Yeah. I, f- I can relate with, um, not education. I did not go to college, but I excelled very young in my career and because I needed a form of validation from others and I needed people to tell me that they loved me in that way because I never got it you know through family and I mean and even today it's like I know I'm loved and I'm trying to feel that more but the logical part of me is like yeah I understand this but yeah when you're a kid it's just like you don't understand anything and you need the you need the necessities which is which is love and it's comfort and it's support. And then of course, you know, roof over your head, food, yeah. nutrition, you know, yeah. education, going to school. It's all those things like, but love more than anything, love like more love, than anything. because there's that one, I forget the name of it, but the chimpanzee experiments with the, the metal. Have you seen these? No. Oh, it's oh so but cute. I can imagine it's adorable and also sad because it's, it's probably... adorable and sad oh, God. <laughs> at the same time. So one chimpanzee, so there's a baby chimpanzee, there's a, a metal 
or like fake chimpanzee mom with a bottle so the little baby chimpanzee can get fed or no it can way. go to the fake chimpanzee that's fucking cuddly and warm and lovely and cushy and it goes to the fake one for like comfort before like over food wow. so it's this really like so both of the mother study. or parental chimpanzees they're fake. they're fake but one yeah. just feeds and then one just cuddles i believe so it's been a while since i've looked at oh. it but i'm pretty sure and then the the chimp always goes to the the cuddly loving one because that yeah when you're a child i mean that's 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 the only thing that you know, which is why it's like children are so beautiful. And like, I have so many people have friends and it's just seeing the world through a little six month old eyes and a one year old. And it's just all they are, are love and all they seek is love and all they need is love. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if yeah. you have that, I think you're so much more likely to be set up to have like those really, <laughs> they seem elusive, but like secure attachments and like good healthy, healthy patterns relationships, healthy relationships. Uh, yeah, no, it's not us <laughs> god i love it um wow yeah so that is incredible um so with so for me do you feel this could be also like a psychologist as as you in your profession there's stigmas for everything and everybody out there. There's yep. stigmas against mental health. There's stigmas against people who are hypersexual, people who are single. I definitely feel that there's a stigma against me, even sometimes within friends. Um, I feel... In what way? Like, for what? Like, um, well, especially when I got into the van, it was really hard for people to keep contact with me. I don't know if you've also experienced that. But I've also had these little moments of, I feel like because I am single, I'm like too much or maybe it's just easier for other people to hang out with couples because they're also coupled up mm -hmm. and that's just what they want to do and they're focusing on that area in life and sometimes I kind of feel like well I'll just be single and <laughs> alone in this van with my dog <laughs> so like a little bit like that but then of course just the stigma of being single being a woman mm -hmm. are you gonna get married are you gonna have kids or like all of this stuff and it's just like can I just not be happy and yeah. single. So do you, uh, like, do you feel like there's stigma against people who are hypersexual or have you felt mm. that personally yourself or do you see that a lot within the work that you do? Yes. So I, myself, um, was always kind of the one in the group who was like, Oh, Katie's like, you know, the flirt. Katie's the one who has like, who loves sex. Katie's the one who loves boys. Like mm -hmm. I was always like boy crazy mm -hmm. within my friend group. So there's always kind of been that label, like, my friend used to call me like the Samantha of like the Sex and the City cast. Well, right? she is the funniest. She's so. the best. She's even, the best. It doesn't even work without her on it now. I know. Uh, I know. I still watch it. I still love it, but it's it's different for sure. Yeah. yeah anyway. So I think there's. I mean, it was it was like it's funny, right? Like it's kind of like a joke. And you have those labels thrown at you, right? Yeah. But like, is it like you know condescending or judgmental? Like maybe a bit. And I right. have friends who like hate sex, like cannot stand it have never had an orgasm like don't want anything it's to painful do with it. Yeah, yeah right yeah. and like i think for especially for them like they really don't don't get it mm -hmm. um but they also you know come from secure homes and right. we've all had different upbringings and issues and right. different different ways of kind of addressing the world and yeah. yeah, it's hard to understand something that you haven't experienced for sure. But I think Absolutely. like conversations like this are probably like really helpful, right? Like I'm really interested to listen to the pansexual one because I've never heard that talked about before yeah. ever. Yeah. And even like demisexuality, like I knew what it was, but I right. have never like dug into that much. Yeah. And asexuality too. Yeah. 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 Oh my gosh, yeah. That's and again, that's like it's a reason why I'm so excited to do this podcast is to get those different perspectives from people who mm. identify a different way, who operate in a different way, who chemically their brain and body tells them they have to do this, and the others, their brain and body tells them to do this. But yeah, Yuki's um, episode is very interesting because she, um, she was, I think, yeah, initially she was straight and then she was bi, and then I was talking with Yuki and another friend um, today, my tantra friend, who I'm going to do an episode with. Um, who was also bi and she was saying listening to your guys's episode and yuki talking about it she was kind of like thinking about 
her own label again because I feel like pansexuality mm. is like kind of a branch of being bisexual huh. because bisexual is like you're attracted to both sexes but pan is just like you're attracted to anybody so if that person mm. doesn't have a sex they are they identify as non-binary or they're a trans man or a trans woman or just trans and they're they're just you know so yeah it's so fascinating that's interesting it's so like fascinating that. yeah yeah and that seems much more like easy breezy inclusive like non very much. It, even though it's a label it's like you kind right. of start getting rid of labels and breaking them down a little bit with right. something like pansexuality which I really appreciate because yeah. I've been with women too not a lot but like a little yeah. and I love women I think women are beautiful right um, yeah energetically wise like I really like masculine energy for my relationships right but um yeah sex wise I think women are are lovely yeah yeah I think it'd be a cool episode to do down the future of um talking about maybe the differences or the stark similarities or stark differences or the you know clear similarities between bisexual and pansexual yeah because it's yeah it's yeah fascinating yeah though. even like an episode like a breakdown of like all of them would be right. really interesting for people who like just don't you know. know don't know that's a good idea Katie yeah. I'm gonna write that down okay I'm jotting that in the back of my head. <laughs> um, okay, so let's, we're at like, I think we're at like 55 minutes, oh which is amazing. God. 51. Well, we've been talking for we've the last chatting. like couple months, so this is easy for us now. <laughs> let's get into, because I think we can talk about this for at least a solid 30 minutes. We don't have to mm. talk for another 30 minutes, but maybe at least attachment styles. Okay. So first off, again, with your profession, and for those who do not know, can you give us insights on all the different attachment styles, mm -hmm. just a little synopsis description of each of them, what your attachment style is. And then if you, cause I have never, there's also that book attachment attached yes. that a lot of people have been reading. A lot of my close friends have recommended it and I've never read it before. And I kind of sit here thinking, do I have an attachment style? So yeah, from yeah. the top, <laughs> what are the attachment styles? I think everyone has an attachment style. For sure. Um, and actually, I haven't read Attached, but when we were chatting about it the other night, I realized the labels that I use mm -hmm. um, to break them down are different than what our friend was using when he was talking about them. So oh, if yeah. you if these don't sound familiar when I when I say them, it's because they're just called something else in a different like right. branch of looking at it or whatever. Right. You can correct us people listening. Yeah, it's you can fine. Just be nice comments. about it, okay? <laughs> so the way we learned it in um, in school, when like in my first master's degree when I was doing counseling psychology, is there are secure attachments, yep. which are kind of healthy, mutually. Those of, who had a very lovely yeah. upbringing. Usually, yes. They were secure in all different facets of life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're there for it. They can yeah. communicate. They don't withdraw. They right. don't... Um, overly kind of um, put themselves kind of on their partner and rely on their partner for validation or anything like that. They are secure in themselves and they are secure in the relationship. So mm -hmm. that is kind of, you know, the ideal to which I strive. Yes. <laughs> um, and hope to get someday. And then there is anxious attachment. Which is you and my dog Zeke. me and Zeke. <laughs> We should I feel like you and Zeke probably have the same attachment style and, and me and your cat fig have the same attachment style. hundred percent. Or the non-attachment style. I think like all cats maybe. I have like a cat. Cats. I think I'm probably a cat at heart. Okay, anyway, so it's anxious attached, which is my me dog and, and you. Yeah. So Zeke and I. Yeah. <laughs> we really we think about our partners when we're in relationships a lot. We want to like make sure they still love us we want right. to like make sure they're happy and like we're doing everything okay and like yeah. we're scared they're gonna leave us yeah. like are you coming back like what do you need can I like yeah. change myself for you like it's yeah. very like anxious right right and I have anxiety anyway and so like it kind of correlates there's that like it makes sense yeah so if you don't have an anxious attachment style but you have had anxiety, you might be able to kind of imagine what it might feel like to have that anxiety just around a relationship. Right. right? So constantly kind of worrying and thinking about it. Yeah. Um, and putting a lot of pressure on it, I think too. And then right. the third is um, avoidant, avoidant attachment mm -hmm. styles, which tend to kind of bounce when things get uncomfortable or things feel a little too deep or they need some they just need maybe more space but their their mo is usually to kind of back off rather than 
anxious attachments, which usually kind of go towards yeah. the partner. So there's right. like this kind of like push and pull thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and what was that one again? That is avoidant. Avoidant. Yes. 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 So anxious, avoidant, and the fourth, the final one, is disorganized. This disorganized. has a, this has another name somewhere, but okay. disorganized is basically kind of a combination of both. So you go back and forth, kind of maybe depending on where the relationship is at or where mm-hmm. you're at or what your partner's doing and how they're acting. Yeah, You can kind of bounce between the two. So I know people who can kind of feel a little like overbearing and mm-hmm. kind of like too, a little too much and too intense and then get a little freaked out and kind of back off and retreat and go into right. themselves or run away completely or whatever it is. Right. So those are the four um, kind of main ones that okay. people fall into, you know, all sorts of different and at different parts in your life too. I think yeah. you can switch. Right. Absolutely. Bit, right. Yeah. You feel a little bit more stable or secure within life mm-hmm. circumstances in life yeah. yourself. You can maybe feel a little more secure, a little more secure, or mm-hmm. you just go, flippity floppity and you're just incredibly disorganized (laughs) yeah sometimes I feel a little overwhelmed in relationships too and then I'll be a little bit more avoidant rather than anxious so if I feel someone's coming kind of if their energy is too much or they're a little too attached or whatever to me I'll start to back off a bit right um or run away or whatever so right it's really interesting to watch it's kind of like a a dance but not a very fun one yes So, and then your last question was about you, right? Well, yeah. What are Fig and I? What are you and Fig? <laughs> well, Fig is definitely avoidant. I feel like I'm probably avoided too. Um, but I, I mean, avoid relationships. But I feel like maybe if and I, even when I get into relationships, I'm a little avoidant. Do you think? Okay. That's well, I've just... only ever had one, and it was only six months long, and I feel like maybe at times I felt like a little anxious, but I think that was also like first relationship jitters of like Mm -hmm. we have to hang out we have to talk all the time and do this stuff but then there was a lot of times where there was a lot of space he traveled um to see his son a lot in Mm -hmm. a different state so yeah did you think things like when am I going to see him Max like is he going to come back how long will it be like will I is he thinking about me when he's gone were there any kind of that that's Maybe a little bit at first, but never no. really okay. took the forefront of my thoughts. Okay. And yeah. then did you feel like overwhelmed and kind of like peeling back at some points? Like, did you feel like you wanted to retreat or needed more space from that? Or oh, It was such an interesting relationship because like I said, it was my first relationship. It's also the first person I slept with. And I think the negative self-talk Kendra was like this is your only opportunity like you have to just go for it sort of thing Mm -hmm. so I found myself doing things that were not like me um in the relationship like feeling that I needed to keep it or make it stronger um he had a lot going on in his personal life at the time and um I think I just had this narrative in my head of literally like this is your only option like this is your only option Kendra like give it your all sort of thing but I feel like I really wasn't feeling it deep down um but it was nice to have someone you know but I I definitely don't think I was like super anxious I think I was trying to make it work because I thought this was like my only hope but um never the like yeah the constant thoughts day to day I mean I still had my life I had my business I was like starting at that time because this was like this was a long, I mean, six, seven years ago. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So maybe more avoidant, but. Maybe, yeah. I don't know. It's hard to say. Definitely not secure. <laughs> <laughs> same, same. Yeah. Same. Definitely and, not secure. And it's hard. I think you see over time, too, like your patterns in relationships mm-hmm. sometimes. And with mm-hmm. you can do this with friends. Like you can tell with family members. Like I have a family member who's married into the family who has um, borderline personality disorder. And she is very like she she has a lot of push pull she's very disorganized yeah and but you could only kind of see that like over time watching her relationships kind of unfold because it could be like um the span of like a year where she's very attached and then maybe something happens and she pulls back for six months or another year or right and you can see it like within the family like her relationship to other people and her friends and Mm -hmm. like stuff like that so it's not just romantic relationships like you can kind of see attachment styles pop up Right. Everywhere. Right. Like, if you've ever wondered, like, oh, or, like, am I being left out of this friend group? Are they mad at me? Did I'm not getting invited to this thing? Like, that's mm. a lot of kind of, like, the similar anxious attachment style stuff coming up, yeah. just in a different 
relationship context. Right. Okay. Maybe I do have a little bit of anxious <laughs> attachment <laughs> to me. I mean, it's good to mix it up. Do both, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Be disorganized. It's Why okay. Not? Yeah. It's its own label. It's its own thing. And that's the thing. Like, most of the vast majority of people don't fall into the secure category. Right. right? So most of us are yeah. like working through Fucked. something and trying to figure it out. Yeah. And like, I think the more information you have about it, the more kind of work you do on it. Right. The more you understand it. So like, right. I know that like growing up in an abusive home mm -hmm. with an alcoholic, I'm more likely to be codependent. I'm more likely to have an anxious attachment style. And like knowing that is really empowering because I can then like start to work on it right. and actually like, try to be like does this relationship actually fulfill me is this what yeah. I'm looking for is this the kind of person I want to be with yeah or is this just like part of my pattern right mm -hmm. yeah that's really fascinating I think when you talk about this stuff I feel like I may have a little bit more of an anxious attachment style with friends but I also feel that way that it might be that case because that's the bulk of my relationships. That's all my relationships. Mm -hmm. I don't have that, you know, sexual, physical relationship with others that I can kind of like relate what my potential attachment style could be. Yeah. And I feel like sometimes I'll cling too hard. I'm learning to let go, which is hard mm -hmm. with some people or just instances. It's kind of putting the focus back on me and seeing what I need and also providing what I know I can provide myself, which I am happy and but like I yeah I feel like when the bulk of my relationships are friendships um I feel like I maybe sometimes um focus on them a little too not like too much in an unhealthy way but it's that's the forefront for me that's what I think about yeah 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 I totally understand I see I'm the same way in my friendships mm -hmm. I worry like am I like doing everything great am I talking too much am I pissing them off like right. yeah. and it's the same anxious thought patterns kind of coming up so and right. right now like I'm single I'm not really dating I haven't been out on more than one date with the same person in right a while I think I don't know if I since my ex so maybe like yeah a year and a half yeah um so I my relationships are all friendships right now too right. and yeah. they're great yeah and they're fulfilling but I still have the same sometimes things come up where I'm like oh right. that's still there we haven't solved this yet <sighs> we haven't cracked it right okay. now okay two questions <laughs> yep. well in relation to the van do you because as someone who's like you're open and willing to date you've been on a couple dates with people like you said no more than like two you know in like a long time but you're still willing you're putting yourself out there which is amazing and beautiful is there a part of you that's like there's no way this is happening until this project is done until I'm out of the van mm. or is there a part of you that's like That's a, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a difficult one. Cause part of me is like, oh, I've been single forever, but I'm going to continue to be single because there's no way I'm going to try and live in a small vehicle with two people. It's not to say that like we would just, you know, automatically move in, like be yeah. my future partner, but it's also kind of like, I don't seek it out because of my current lifestyle. Yeah. It's an interesting way. Yeah. It's an interesting way to live and figure out dating. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that noise. Yeah. That noise is my feeling. Yeah. Um, I have learned over time in my life, like, not to make any assumptions about how anything is going to play out. Yeah. Um, I'm Keep not it a open. huge, I'm not a huge planner because I feel like if I just feel kind of a, it sounds super, like, it sounds a little silly, but like, if I just feel aligned with the universe and like, mm -hmm. I'm doing my thing and pointing in the right direction and like doing what I find most interesting yeah. and engaging and important. Yeah. Um, and I'm, you know, open, willing to, but I'm super happy being single. So I don't yeah. feel like I need it yeah. at all. Um, I do get excited when I like meet a new cute boy and I'm like, Oh, are you my person? Maybe. Yep. Um, Disney princess fantasy sure. plays into your brain. <laughs> right. it, it, it gets in there, but then I don't hang on to it as much as I used to. I don't feel like I have to, you know, stop and make this work. I'm not going to derail my trip to probably like, you know, settle right. down somewhere if I find someone I like. Um, Cause that's always in the, like, you can always do that. But like yeah. in the present time right now, this is your, you've got a big project you're working yeah, on. Yeah, this is my jam. And yeah. I feel like if I met someone who was the right person for me, they would be the kind of person who would understand that, who would give me space to do it, who would either, you know, want to come along for parts of it or, you know, just keep dating after I was done or whatever. So right. I just kind of trust that it'll work out. I'm not too... I don't really spend a lot of time thinking about it. I have people who 
like really, really, really want a partner and a family. Mm-hmm. And I'm kind of, it's not that I don't want those things. I yeah, do. You do. Yeah. But I'm not, you know, designing my life around it because right. this is the most important thing to me right now. Yeah. Cause like there's other project. aspects of life that are so bigger many. than, yeah. And they're so magical too. Like exactly. sitting around with you guys the past like few weeks, traveling, yeah. like seeing new sites and new places and meeting so many neat people of all different ages as well because there's also the stigma of like oh you've got to do this and this and this by this age and this and this and it's just like no Mm -hmm. yeah and I hate that stick the stigma of you need the American you know picket fence family sort of thing like you've got to pump out 15 kids by your 30 and you know all these things retire by this age and it's just it's not the way of life for a lot of people and it sucks that that's especially generational too it's like you know you got aunts and uncles grandparents it's like when's this gonna happen it's like well what if it never happens yeah (laughs) am i not living a fulfilling life still right yeah and i think like i feel like i am like i've never been happier probably than i am right now my mental health has never been better than it is right now yeah um i feel very balanced happy like i'm doing the right thing at the right time in the right place all that kind of stuff yes and i don't need like a dude to you know make anything complete or anything like that right um but yeah, I mean, I would love to fall in love again. That sounds great. Yeah. And I'm sure I will. Like, For sure, there's yeah. There's so many people out there. There's so many nice, great, interesting, kind, smart people. Right. And I'm sure I will find another one. Yeah. And maybe we'll oh, have will. Yeah. a fence. I hope not, but maybe. It'll but. be a different kind of fence. <laughs> right. And I'm Maybe being... a wire fence. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. And I'm older than you, too, so I yeah. am about to turn 39, and so my, like, whole thing about kids has had to shift over the past few years because like if I don't have them myself right like I really want to adopt some right maybe older yeah for one I don't know one yeah or two. um and so I've had to kind of be flexible and like what right. my future looks like because of mm-hmm. you know other things that are important to me too yeah and just the way kind of life you know has panned out and right. stuff and all this learning that we have to do to get to a healthy place where we can have yeah. those cool relationships. Yeah. And that, yeah, there's no end goal and there's no, there's no age that you have to be anywhere because your growth journey, your healing journey and your path, mm-hmm. it's going to land you where you need to be. Like I'm still healing from a lot of childhood drama and maybe those who had more of a secure upbringing and are secure attachment styles or who pinpointed that early on in life and process through you're ready to move on to the next step. I'm not, I'm not yet. Yeah. And then I think there's a lot of people who move on to the next step without being ready. Right. And that stuff comes out sideways in different ways. Exactly. And it's like, honey, what are you doing? (laughs) You should not be doing this. (laughs) Either get out, be by yourself or get, yeah. The, the whole, yeah. Yeah. Like, cause like stuff doesn't make you happy, right? Like a white picket fence and you don't have to do the societal pressures and the norms Mm. just because you think you have to do that. If it's not, Mm especially if it's not feeling aligned within yourself and only you are going to be able to decipher and discern that yourself. Mm -hmm. That's why I love that book that we were talking about earlier. The North Star. Yeah. I really want to read it. It breaks it down. Like, and there's so many exercises in it too. Like at the end of every chapter, there's just pages of exercises, which are so helpful. And you're like, Oh yeah. Like that's what I actually like feel like it goes through like every hour of your day and like what you're doing and like whether it drains you or fills you up people Mm -hmm. in your life relationships I ended up breaking up with my partner after I read that book so be careful when you read it um yeah it was really really interesting wow and you start to identify all these things that actually make you happy and you realize like there's no set way to do this right like life is not like a a linear thing it's very like expansive and you can move in any direction at any time exactly Um, and then of course I Yuki and I spoke about this in our episode just having that support too I know you say you're really close with your mom uh she'll do anything at the drop of the hat to like come save you or protect you even even at 39 she's like I am here for you (laughs) you need to move back in and but that's also nice to have when you're not having I mean and the same with my parents they just fully support me they love that I'm doing this they're not shoving down marriage or grandbabies. Oh, they no. have a great grandson Zee. right here. They've got a great grandchild that they love tremendously. But it's like, that's also so important to have that too and be able to figure, not figure, but to be able to move through life in the way that you want to and also have that like support. And yeah. Yeah. And a lot of people don't have that. Like a lot, a lot of, people of people don't have that. are on this trajectory that they feel like they're supposed they to be on. They have to be on. Yeah. And yeah, it's nice to have someone who, my mom has never like, 
never pressured me to do anything. Yeah. Right? She's like, I had a really shit dad, but I had a really great mom. And thank God. Balance. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Just need one. Just need like one good human in your life. Yeah. And I think you'll be okay. No, seriously. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, I have like a final little question for yep. you. Hit me. Um, just with what we, you, what we were talking about and all of this stuff, your background, hypersexuality, your past and everything, do you have any sort of like advice or guidance for people who feel the same way that you feel in just maybe living more authentically to themselves? Maybe they have shame around their sexuality or wanting to have sex like is there anything you want to tell them or I know it's like kind of a loaded big broad question no but... I think that's a good question I um let me think to the listeners out there <laughs> to the non-asexuals or the asexuals or the pans or to everybody everybody, everybody. yeah um do you have any advice I I think figuring out for me yeah figuring out my patterns and why I like what's at the heart of why I think and feel and behave the way I do. Yeah. Like what really is deeply rooted that is informing those decisions and even those feelings that come up, right? So like we feel we're triggered by certain things and we feel certain ways automatically, right? Right. Figuring out like what's at the heart of that for me has been really valuable. Um, to start like remapping some of those kind of neural pathways in my brain and yes. developing new ones and like new, like even ways of thinking, right? And this is why yeah. people use affirmations and put them on their walls because mm -hmm. you have to really actively, because it's so fucking hard to undo shit in your brain. Yes. You have to actively make this huge effort to create a new model for your life or design for your life or whatever right or way of being in the world and that's been it's a lot of work and it takes a really long time and it's so iterative and sometimes it feels like you're not making a lot of progress yeah but I think like just chipping away at it being aware of it finding people who support you has been really useful for me whether that's friends therapists mm -hmm. I don't really let anything in my life anymore that feels in any way like negative or toxic that's been a huge help yeah. so I cut yeah. my dad out yeah probably 12 years ago of my life I don't yeah. I've cut out a few friends who yeah. don't feel super aligned or supported or whatever positive yeah. <laughs> so it's just I think it's a matter of finding like what works for you right I do a lot of that by reading yeah um but there's different ways of doing that too, right? Groups, right. therapy, just chatting it out with friends. Yeah. All sorts of self-discovery right. methods out there. So whatever works for you. Right. You were saying earlier the integration, like the recognition and then finding, like diving into that a little bit more for yourself. Yeah. Like, yeah, or with the help of a therapist or... Yeah. And know. then you start doing the, the fun kind of putting things into action piece and finding things that work that make it all feel tied together and stuff. Right. So... That looks different for everybody. Everybody, yeah. exactly. Everyone's journey, path, trajectory is going to be 100% different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's good advice. Yeah. Realizing the patterns. And God, we didn't even talk about the brain. How? <laughs> oh, the brain. Oh, the, the brain. brain. The neurological reprogramming. And yeah, how yeah. long that can take. Like the book that I'm reading. The, oh, yeah, that's right. The Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself. Mm -hmm. And that is hard work. It's not just like... Yeah. Oh, I've recognized this and I'm going to be better. It's like, no, you, the reprogramming is very vital, yeah. but it's probably some of the hardest work that I'm still trying to do. I'm trying to curb slash quit a addiction with weed and all of this stuff. Yeah. It's yeah, it's very difficult. Yeah. And I think just like, like being really kind to yourself and gentle on yourself yeah. while you're doing that too is really yes. important because it's so easy to you know, slip up or not make the progress that you want to make and just quit or get down on yourself or whatever right. the negative self-talk comes in. But yeah, yeah, I think for, for trauma stuff too, like for me, EMDR and biofeedback have both been really helpful. Mm. So those are two of like the kind of brain reprogramming things that I really love. Okay. What's EMDR? Can you give a quick little description? Eye movement something. Hold on. Let me find the thing. Eye movement. And then the other one you said bioactivity? Bio, biofeedback. Biofeedback. Yeah. So I can put a link. I can send you a link for both okay. so people can look them up. But, yes, um, please. I'll put it in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> so my therapist and I started doing EMDR. Let me make eye movement desensitization reprocessing. Whoa. Yeah. So you have um, like little things on your body where you like there's lights and like you... It's, it's so you need to do it with a really well-trained person, right? They walk you through memories. You start to 
think like how that memory makes you feel you get at the heart of it you wow. think about an alternative way of thinking about that thing or what could have been how whatever it's so interesting and very scientific so yeah wow yeah so and how long have you been doing that just recently so i did it a little bit when i was a kid i had a uh-huh. car accident when i was 16 where someone passed away and i did it for three years after that and then I did it the last couple of years with actually the same therapist, wow. but just, you know, 20 years later. Yeah. That's <laughs> awesome that they were, they're still practicing. Oh yeah, she's great. We love oh her. She can gosh. never stop. She's never allowed to not. Well, clearly it sounds like she's doing some good work she's in this. Great. Wow. We love her. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. But yeah. They offer it everywhere now. So if you've ever okay. had any kind of traumatic stuff that anyone yeah. wants to undo, that is one of the big ones that I would recommend. Wow. That's definitely better than coping with drugs, alcohol, or just sitting and sulking or processing and downward spiraling. That's... Yeah. <laughs> there, science can help you. It can help. Yeah. I mean, I still do a little bit of like the, right. the, the wine coping sometimes too, but you know, we all? a little bit yeah. of, a little bit of healthy stuff, a little yeah. bit of vices. Yeah. 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 We'll get there eventually. Oh my gosh. Wow. That is so <laughs> cool. EMDR. EMDR. Wow. Yeah. Are you liking that book you're reading? Yes. Okay, good. Very much so. i to get so. it from you when you're done. Yes. It'll be a year and a half. Okay. But because <laughs> I'm the world's slowest reader. We'll be in Mexico on a beach. <laughs> we will be in Mexico on a beach. Mm-hmm. I will get it done by then. Okay. But he also, um, Joe Dispenza, for those also listening, is an amazing, um, he's a doctor um, and author. I have two of his other books and I want to finish this one first because I feel like this kind of is like the start of like these other two books but mm-hmm. you'll love the other two books the other book that he well he has several other books but the other two that I have are you are the placebo mm. so he goes into detail about how he has helped people cure themselves of like you know terminal illnesses and diseases and stuff it's fascinating so it's all the neuro you know pathways chemicals and reprogramming and all that stuff and then um the other one he has is becoming supernatural Hmm. so i have those on deck and i definitely need to finish this too and then i also need to finish our six dollar book that we got at cvs (laughs) together (laughs) the murder mystery the murder mystery yes you gotta mix it up guys we got exactly heavy and some light exactly oh my gosh katie well this has been wonderful we're obviously chilling for the rest of the day but we're signing off now (laughs) gonna turn the mic off we're gonna turn the mic off but we're probably gonna continue talking um i did not do this my last episode so i'm trying to be a little bit more i mean this is my second interview so i will be better this time for the people let where can they find you where can they find you have a specific instagram and tiktok for her amazing trip that she's doing the year-long trip working on her second book tell them all the places that yeah they can find you and stuff probably the easiest is instagram or tiktok and it is the states of the nation mm-hmm. um i think there's like periods between it but between each um, i think so on instagram states. at least and then um i have a consulting website which is drkatiecook.com mm-hmm. but um yeah i mean instagram is like the funnest right, right. tiktok is the funnest right so and then they both go where the go where the fun is bleed yeah. together now mm-hmm. you do a video on tiktok and you also post it on instagram yeah no you don't want to <laughs> it's a lot of it's a lot of work already <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to do that shit twice like <laughs> repurpose fair facts facts well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank and you. This was so fun, Zeke. You were so good. You, was, you did not move this entire time. You napped just like how I wanted you to. Holy and shit. Yeah. What good a job. good supervisor you are. What a good atta- anxious attachment dog. <laughs> he feels secure <laughs> right now, doesn't he? He definitely feels secure right yeah, now. We are. It is also a little warm, but... He's in a good spot. He's in a good spot. Well, thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, thank you. so much for being here again another episode down and my second interview done that was my friend katie cook again you can find her at drkatiecook.com katie spelled k-a-t-y or on tiktok or instagram at states of the nation i'm so excited to be able to continue to do this i'm having so much fun with this I will be back in a couple more weeks with another solo episode just with me where I go into the statistics of the single woman, more importantly, the single 30-year-old woman. 
so excited for that. And then following that um, episode, I will have my third interview with a good friend of mine named Zach. And we are taking a full 180 here. And instead of talking about sex like Katie and I did, Zach and I are going to talk about celibacy. (laughs) So it's going to be great. Thank you all so much for being here again. Yeah, this is incredible.